what are like what kind of what are some of those norms and and how do you establish them with your students at the beginning we can kind of sum it up into like simple terms like be respectful and then we might break it down from there and say okay like being respectful might be or it might look like this and might not look like this so like we might be like oh um being respectful is not laughing at somebody if they ask a question even if you think it's a dumb question what's going on i, I step up i i ask the teacher what is going on and I did that. I did that with my friend. I would do did it for everybody else because I am that person. I am kind. I am kind. And did I mention I'm kind to everybody? <laughs> you, did I mention I'm kind? <laughs> no, you didn't. Can you can you not just give them a detention for having their oh phones Oh my out? gosh, Jack! I wish teachers could get detention these <laughs> days. <laughs> it doesn't help. Even if you do, they'll just get out the next day. Jack, I've written kids up that don't get detentions, but we'll, we'll, we'll just not talk about that. And this is me very much generalizing. Obviously, I don't work in a school, but I think the response to teachers from parents is not as supportive as I feel it was when we were students. Like, I think we've even talked about this, Jack. Like, All right, guys. We got... We got a special guest today, and she is the the really special guest of the day. Good, good evening on Baker's Bakery, and and we got a special guest today on this lovely, lovely Baker's Bakery. Give it up for Jenna Nichols, Nichols. Jenna Nichols Baker, best friend of all, all best friends. Get rid of her, Catherine. <laughs> oh my God. Hello. I did not know where that intro was going because it took forever. <laughs> I was thinking he was stalling because he forgot your name or something. Will that be okay? No, 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 no. I did not forget her name. It's pretty You've easy only known her for remember. a decade, Derek. That is true. I do, I, I do know that. Yes. It is very close to back to school. It is very close to back very to school. Very close to back well, to school. Well, the day this podcast comes out will be Catherine and Katie Baker. Catherine, also Catherine, <laughs> um, their first day of school. Yes. It will with, be, with students. It will be my first day of my second year of teaching. Do you know what year you'll be this on? This is my fifth year of teaching. Wow. Wow. Yeah. First, fifth no, it gets better than that. Well, okay, Katie's on her second. Second. <laughs> She's second. already had her first. Give me credit where credit's due. That was a hard year to get through. <laughs> you know what's actually well, funny about well, Catherine, Derek? That. I don't ever want to do my first year of teaching again. No, whenever, whenever I hang out with Catherine and Katie, you know, sometimes I'll try to get Katie's attention. And when I get Katie's attention, or when I'll she say, gets angry at me, or or when I get mad, and I'll say, Catherine. <laughs> and my my lovely friend Catherine here will think I'm yelling at her every time. Yeah, Jenna will wow. catch an attitude with me and say me tell, call me by my full name, and Catherine will be like, "I'm in trouble. What did I do?" <laughs> Catherine, will be like, "What did I do? I'm sorry." I don't know why I always forget every time too, even though it's happened multiple times. Yeah, well, it's because <laughs> typically we call her Katie, but sometimes when I am being sassy or need to get her attention, I do hit her with the Catherine, and then I forget that well, I'm also yelling at you, you now. Always do, Jenna. <laughs> I think that's really cool. You do do just just that, and yes, you're right. It is back to school. Katie's on her second. Calvary is on her fifth. Miss Bergman. Yep. That's that's pretty cool. We got <laughs> Catherine and Catherine and Miss Bergman and Miss Baker. Yeah, we got oh two KBs. Two, two Miss KB. B. Anyway, my first question is. Is, is damn it for you, Calf, right? Is what for me? Definitely for you. He okay. Said my first question is definitely for you, Catherine. Okay. It, Let's hear it. It's for you. So, how do you feel at a, become a teacher and you in, in this organization of, of schools, like, like everywhere? I got to know why you got interested in going your fifth year i mean we are g going back to school back to school is 
next week. How are you feeling for this year now? So I'm actually very excited for this year. Being my fifth year, I feel like I really have the hang of certain things. And like I kind of know what I want to do. And I feel like I can improve upon a lot of things that I've done the past four years that maybe didn't go so well. But I feel like I have the swing of things now. Do you think all the kids res respect you? Uh, how that works out? Let me rephrase that. What do you do to earn the kids' respect? Yeah. So that's a good question. So one thing I like to do is I get to work with my group of kids pretty closely and just different ways of getting to know them simply by having like a conversation, doing like a get to know you game, get to know you sheets. One thing my kids can always do is get me off topic sometimes, especially if they're talking about food or different restaurants. They always have a lot of cool suggestions. So those are just some of the few ways that I get to know them. And I think from there, that's how you start to build respect with them. Will you yeah. kind of describe what type of classroom you teach in? Yeah. So I have a classroom. Um, my student, each student has a disability. They have a, they really have a wide range of disabilities and it kind of depends um, each classroom I'm in because I do um, see a bunch of different kids. But um, I'm also trying to think of what I can say and what I can't say. Um, I work with students who have behavioral needs and emotional needs, but they also have academic needs as well. So most of them are like, would you say it's more of like an intellectual disability, less um, physical disability? I think they're called like behavioral disabilities, right? So like emo emotional, emotional disturbance. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And I hate the name an emotional disturbance I like try to call it like an emotional disability because yeah. I think that sounds like a little bit better than so you don't necessarily have any students with like developmental disabilities um some okay yeah I have had some in the past um and what age group are you teaching high schoolers and typically how many kids are you having in a classroom at one point? um it can range from depending on like if they're getting pulled out for services or absences um I can have anywhere from like four or three kids to like the biggest classroom I think I've had like nine kids in at a time. So you're in a classroom where these kids aren't necessarily with you for the whole school day, but they're pulled into your classroom for a specific like interventions or? No. So um, the way it works is like I teach a certain subject at my school. Like okay. I teach English and okay. I will rotate to different classrooms. So I will see my students like every single day. Like, so you do know. you push into a gen ed class? No. Okay. So my building is 100% special education. Okay, okay. So yeah. So each class, um, each student has a disability in my building. And um, yeah. So you do. Cool. What subject in, in school you teach? So I teach English and um, social skills. Wow. <laughs> wow that's really cool yeah it's fun I like doing English like different stories kind of brings me back to when I was in high school doing all the fun English stories <laughs> did you always see yourself as being like working with people with disabilities um starting in high school yes I worked at a camp for kids with disabilities and I kind of fell in love with like working with that population and I guess I didn't really know at first like how do I make this a career um and then I kind of stumbled on special ed. For the longest time, I thought I was going to do occupational therapy. But then I I just wanted to be in the classroom with them, teaching them like academics and life skills and whatnot. So do a lot of your students, do you have them for like multiple years? Like I know when Derek was in school, mm -hmm. he had his teacher, Miss Robinson, from like freshman year to senior year and they kind of all grew together as a class like how does that work for you guys so our school um I can definitely have some students for like all four years that they're mm -hmm. there but it really just depends like if they're going back to like a home school like a home district um some of them will come for you know a couple years and they might move or they might transfer but for the most part we do have a lot of kids that we're able to see like grow over a couple different school years. So do you have like when you, when you have, if it's a group of three students, is it three freshmen? Is it 
could be all various ages like I mean, how does really, that work it really just depends on what credits they need so like my students are still graduating by taking like credits um like your english sciences and math and social studies so i could have a class where it's like three freshmen but then there's like a junior in the class or i might have a class of like sophomores and freshmen so it really just depends what course they need so when we were talking about you coming on the podcast we talked about like the types of disabilities that your students have Mm -hmm. and one of the things that we talked about was like the non-visible disabilities and that and you kind of like wanted to touch on how that's like important and and also maybe probably even a little bit more difficult to navigate at times Mm -hmm. because you know somebody with down syndrome like it's very clear that they have down syndrome yeah or somebody with a physical disability if they use a wheelchair that's their disability is very prevalent mm-hmm. like your the kids you work with that's not necessarily the case correct so a lot of my students just by looking at them you might not know necessarily that they have a disability or they're you know dealing with different things um Which, honestly, before I started working with this group and started going to school for special education, like, I don't think I knew that much about, you know, disabilities that you couldn't see. You know, like, I knew about all the typical disabilities that you hear and, like, learn about and see. But um, it just kind of, like, makes you think and realize, like, a lot of people that you encounter might be, might have a disability or might be, you know, struggling with something whether it's like a trauma or something else so that just kind of opened my eyes to like thinking about everyday interactions with people that like you don't even know you know what are some examples of some like diagnoses that your students could have well definitely like the emotional like in Missouri it's called an emotional disturbance but like an emotional disability um even sometimes like ADHD I feel like you can't always tell right off the bat that somebody has that. Um, sure. One that I've dealt with before is ODD, which is, I think, pretty similar to the emotional disturbance dis- uh, diagnosis. Yeah. The oppositional defiant mm-hmm. disorder. Yeah. I've had a few students that were diagnosed that in the past. That's um, a tricky one. It is. <laughs> it really is. You have to, like, really get you to really know the student. To, yeah. You have to, like, I feel like especially in your case, like, that relationship building is so essential to, like, mm-hmm. success because – Like, a lot of times I feel like, especially the kids who, like, do have those different, like, emotional disabilities or just, you know, I mean, even if you have a kid with, like, super bad anxiety, like, you have to be able to build that kind of trust. Mm -hmm. And, like, the kids are only going to give you as much as they want to give you a lot of times. So it's, like, building that relationship and, like, that foundation for, hey, like, we're going to be here together this school year. So, like, let's make it a good one, not a Mm -hmm. bad one. (laughs) Well, and some of my students have had negative experiences with teachers in the past, Mm -hmm. whether that be a general education teacher or another special education teacher. So I just kind of try to like keep that in mind, like, oh, they might not have had a good experience. They might not have felt safe or wanted or cared for because I genuinely do care for all my students. And I do think that every student has a right to like be there and feel safe and feel welcomed in the classroom. But I have to remind myself that they might not have always felt like that. So like you were saying, it definitely helps to like build that with them. So you said your class sizes vary, but if you're only teaching them English, I'm assuming obviously they're going to be going to other classes as well. So just a range, like a guesstimate, how many students would you say you usually have in one semester just throughout Um, the days? Maybe around 25. Okay. Like that's how many I would see each day. But then like some students like – Our students can be transient and like some will only stay like the first, you know, couple weeks and then they might move or um, like we get a lot of students coming in and leaving. So, yeah, that's interesting. I feel like it's um, it's just different. I feel like compared to my experience as teaching, because Uh even last year as a first year teacher and with the the way that my layout was with my block scheduling, I had two sections of kids that instead of seeing them every other day, mm-hmm. I saw them every day for 90 minutes. Okay. So those two sections obviously could be four sections in a different situation. Mm-hmm. So I only had like 75-ish students in comparison to most people's like 
120 plus. That's still so much though. So it, but exactly. Me. It's still so yeah. much compared to you. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Like I know um, special ed teachers that work in a gen ed setting, they might have like 60 kids on their caseload. And I just think that is wild and so much work. And I just think, how do you get to know them? And I, I know they do get to know them really well, but I just think that would be so hard. Yeah. So you work in a student in a school where everyone has a disability. Yes. Have you ever worked before in a school that does have a general education population? No, I haven't actually. Okay. Did you do any practicums or anything? I'm just curious about the parallels and like how yeah. that works. So I student taught in a gen ed building and I actually taught in, a, in, in an elementary school. Which was like very different. Very different, yeah. So different. And I loved that experience, but it was also during COVID. Mm. So I was so sad. So it got cut short. So like I didn't get to do the full semester, but I loved it. Like if I ever switched schools or something, I would probably want to go to like an elementary school. Um, But it was very different. And it was interesting seeing the setup of like a special ed teacher like pushing into a classroom or pulling out like small groups. Um. So yeah, it was extremely different. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So I think going into last year, Katie didn't necessarily really like know what to expect. She was given some different pieces of advice. She took some of them, didn't take others. But as someone who's got a little bit more experience, what is your, like, how do you go into preparing for the next school year? And what do you suggest for Katie as far as like, Mentally preparing, preparing your classroom, all the types of things. Oh, okay. So definitely talk with your coworkers. Like that always helps me if I like notice something that I'm confused about. Like I always ask questions. Um, One thing that helps me prepare like, and I guess it's a little different because you have more kids than I see, but like I like look at all their IEPs and their goals um, and I try to like plan a fun first week of like relationship building and like getting to know you but also like I go over like the rules the procedures the routines um like class contracts and I I'm assuming your school probably has like school rules you know Mm -hmm. stuff like that what's a Um, class contract so that is where like my students and I for whatever class period (laughs) what I don't know what it is I want to know a contract Easy contract is is a, is signing up. P- p- I p- know people. what a contract is, Derek. I <laughs> want to know Am what I a correct. But that you are yes. Do do your students yes. sign the class contract? They do. So we come up with like rules together of how like they should behave, but we also come up with like how the teacher should behave or what the teacher should try to do. Within reason. <laughs> Within See, reason. Okay, so this is funny because I used to always say in my classroom, like, positive classroom environment, positive classroom mm-hmm. environment. And then my kids would piss me off and I would kind of snap at them and then they'd use it against me. They're like, Miss Baker, you're not creating a positive classroom <laughs> environment. I'm like, oh, shh. So maybe you need a classroom contract. <laughs> maybe. Well, you know, so when I was starting, people told me, like, don't smile till Thanksgiving, whatever, whatever. Mm. And I was like, that's not my personality, yeah. whatever. I'm like, I can't do that. Did I have a horrible <laughs> first semester or what? So because you didn't smile or because because you did I was she walked too nice. all over me. Oh, I like okay. I didn't develop their respect. Mm-hmm. And they just were like, OK, this girl's a joke. Like, let me just. They're like, she's literally like my older sister. I don't give a shit what she says. <laughs> no, literally. <laughs> I so, always told her, I'm like, good thing you're tall. Like, can you imagine if she was like 5'1 oh. and only like six years older than these high schoolers? <laughs> like, my God. No, but that's intimidating and it's hard. Like, especially like for your first year, because mm-hmm. like you really like have to learn how to like, like you said, Ooh. you're not like a mean person. That's not your personality. I think that. If you don't show them your real personality, like if you fake it, like they're going to see through that too. And they're not going to think you're genuine. So it's like hard to find like that balance between like, okay, I need to make sure that I'm like building respect and Mm -hmm. they understand that this is like, that I mean business while also like I do want to have like that kind side that they can see and that they know that I'm trustworthy Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So hopefully I can walk that line a little bit better this year. So you kind of started talking about like building that classroom 
like rules and expectations at the beginning. What are like what kind of what are some of those norms and and how do you establish them with your students at the beginning? So some of the like norms, I would say we can kind of sum it up into like simple terms, like be respectful. And then we might break it down from there and say, okay, like being respectful might be or it might look like this and might not look like this. So like we might be like, oh, um, being respectful is not laughing at somebody if they ask a question, even if you think it's a dumb question. Being respectful is like not touching somebody and in their space. How you feel about having a teaching a disability kids and to be grown men and women when they are. So I think that is probably one of the most important classes is like that life skills class and kind of like you were starting to say real world skills I think and one thing I like to do is I do ask them like okay what real world skills do you guys want to learn and if it's honestly if it's something that I know that I don't know a lot about I try to find them a resource that does or I might say oh hey ask our math teacher about this you know if they ask about taxes or something, you know, (laughs) personal finance, Yeah, (laughs) your personal finance teacher. But um, especially since I teach English, I try my best to relate like English to like the real world. And sometimes because you have to follow state standards, you can't always 100 percent relate something to the real world. But overall, like I try my best to, you like, know. Can you teach them how to write an email? Or yeah. So that's a, that's actually a good example. Um, even just like writing skills and typing skills. Like one thing I talk with them about is like, hey, like in the future, if you have to email your future your boss, like you can't have a bunch of typos and you can't have, you know, you know, just like it all hey, over bestie. the place. Yeah. Hey, bestie or something like that. Um <laughs> So you said at the beginning you try to kind of create like a fun first week. What are some like what's like a fun classroom activity that you've created and how do the students respond to it? So one thing and in teaching they always say everything is like borrowing from other teachers. Mm -hmm. So I can't say this was my original idea. But one thing I do is an activity called guess my teacher's favorite. And there's like a list and I can send it to you later. Okay, perfect. There's like a list of like my favorite drink is, my favorite food is, my favorite color. And I'll just ask them like, okay, guess. And because my room, it's not overly decorated, but it has like pink and like a lot of colors. They like, always, they have fun with that. <laughs> like, what's your favorite wrestler? Yeah, I do have a favorite wrestler. What's yours? Oh God, what is his name? The Undertaker. That's awesome. Because my little brother, Derek, used to really like The Undertaker. And so I was like, pretty cool. That's a big man. So within, you know, education and everything, I think we all have, especially with uh, four years under your belt, I'm sure you have some wild stories. Do you have anything like is the most what's the most like outrageous thing either a student or a parent has ever said to you? Um, I mean, or just maybe like an incident that happened in your classroom that was just I mean, I will say. I've heard a lot of curse words and a lot of combinations of curse words that I never thought existed. So like that's kind of something I had to get used to. It's like I expected an occasional like medium, you know, not so bad curse word, but I've heard horrible combinations. They probably say curse words you didn't even know were curse words. They do. They did. They have. And they how do. do you like how do you deal with that or try to get it to stop? I mean, I do like to say, like, please use different language. And I know, like, out of habit, we'll say, watch your language, watch your language. But I try to, like, say, okay, so you're telling me you're frustrated by saying this. You could also ask me for help instead of cursing. Or you could say, I like to do, like, what does Buddy the Elf say? Um, Son of a nutcracker. Like, (laughs) I'll do really, really dorky things like that. And I'll be like, you could say what I say. (laughs) They don't do that, though. No. I, try, I try to get them to do that, but... You mean like, Santa! Oh, my God! <laughs> yeah. Santa, I know him. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a... You like that movie. We love that movie. Do you have a specific student who has, like, really left an impact on you? And if so, like, what do you... What, what do you remember about it? I've, I have a couple. 
I have like there's a few students that I found um, just like I felt like I wasn't making helping them, you know, and I was like trying to figure them out. And like, I think like one thing that always helps me is like when a student, whether they're in like a crisis situation or upset about something, when they use like when they finally use like a strategy or when they're finally it like clicks for them. And whether it's just me or, you know, my group of coworkers, at that moment always, like, makes me feel really good. And it just makes me feel good that, oh, hey, like, this would have really upset them, like, last year. But this year, they're telling me, oh, can I go on a walk instead? Or can I please talk to so-and-so? And that's where it, like, really clicks for me. Is like, oh, they do, they do get it eventually. And they do sometimes listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're learning. Always. Yeah. <laughs> So this is kind of a question for both of you. How, as you're going into the school year, I feel like it's just me personally. I don't do well with ch- different changes. So going from summer to school, like I feel like I would really struggle with that. So mentally, <laughs> the, go, the mornings are not going to treat me nicely. I've been calling <laughs> Katie at like 830 in the morning and uh, she'll like barely be awake or be like mad that I woke her up. I'm like, girl, oh, yeah. you better start waking up. But so how I know, Katie, this is your first time going back. So so you might not have like, a, a you know regimen yet but how do you mentally prepare for being back in the classroom every day so I think by setting myself up for the week whether it's like meal prepping or like like making sure I have all my energy drinks that I need for that week um or like just like going maybe I'll have to try (laughs) not prime hydration though (laughs) hey electrolytes help yeah they do yeah they do But yeah, I think just by getting like everything else in my environment set up, that kind of gets my mind ready. Like, okay, now I'm going to work. I mean, I'm definitely sad because I have some other teacher friends that like I know you don't go back yet, that they're still at like the pool or something. And I'm like, oh, I really miss that. But (laughs) well, today was my last day. I go back tomorrow. And it was raining all day. (laughs) And this is dorky. But one thing that helps me get set up is I always I try to buy myself a cute, fun planner. And then I get excited to write in my planner with like new pens. So, (laughs) yeah. I actually just had the pleasure of decorating my first classroom. (gasps) Because uh, as first year teacher, I was just kind of traveling between, you know, multiple different classrooms. And so this year I have one classroom that I'm teaching in. So one of the things that has got me excited is just being able to like decorate it in a way that is like aesthetically pleasing to me and like Mm -hmm. gets me excited and um another thing is I I really enjoy my coworkers, so I'm excited to get to like see them again every day like I went back up to school a couple weeks ago to um you know decorate my classroom and stuff and I ran into one of my coworkers and I gave her the biggest hug and I was like it just like I was like wow I actually really missed this person like who I saw every day for you know, the school year. And now I haven't seen mm-hmm. really or talked to them in months. So yeah. it'll be good to just like be able to see them again. Um, and also, I think that I'm really good with the routine. You know, obviously, this summer has been really nice being able to just like decompress and relax and kind of be on my own time and sleep but, in. and sleep in. Sleep in <laughs> is great. But like <laughs> at the same time, like it's really good for me when I do have more structure to my life. And I just feel like I'm able to get so much more done with my time because I'm not wasting so much of it, like Mm -hmm. doing nothing. Um, So, yeah, I'm excited to have that structure back. Like Catherine said, I, I too, am a meal prep girly. Mm -hmm. And so I really like to get my, you know, week ready for the most part, especially because I'm a fall sport coach. So, like, especially the first, you know, weeks of school where I'm coaching, it's really important that I set myself up for success, like, at the Mm -hmm. beginning of the week, because otherwise I'm going to hate myself by the end. Yeah, I think (laughs) that first semester last year with her... Being a first time teacher plus being a coach. Yeah, that it would kind be of like hit busy. you like a brick wall. It did. But now I just feel like I could conquer the world because that's good. Like I did it and this year's gonna be so much easier. Like last year I was doing two of the slow down paces of algebra one and one geometry. This year I'm just doing two of the slow down paces of algebra one and then a regular algebra one. So oh, really right. I can use 
a lot of the same materials. I'm talking about the same content. Like I don't have to be yeah. like preparing two contents at the same time. And so, and, and I've also, I've already done all of it once. That's good. So yeah. like I can go back and think, okay, what worked, what didn't. I can use old things. And yeah. again, I've got a really great team to lean on. So I'm excited. I was going to say the coworkers are like the best part because they help you through a lot of the situ- situations that you mm-hmm. go through. So yeah, I've actually got a coworker who hopefully is going to bring my tortured teachers <laughs> department shirt with her tomorrow oh. because she texted me this summer and said, oh my God, we need these. And she sent me these shirts from TikTok shop that said, tortured teachers department all is fair in love and lesson play or all is all in, all is fair in maybe love and lesson planning i, I love that love was the first word or not but. <laughs> so what for both of you again what is something that you're going to change about your approach in the classroom this year versus your your past one year or your past many years oh whoever wants to go first. i'll let you think on that because mine's easy okay phones Okay. And this is actually, thank you. Shout out to Dina Seiler. I don't know if she listens to this, but she's actually who sent me this Facebook message of what my phone policy is going to be. So if any teachers out there are listening, this is what I'm going to try. So buy a bunch of like little knapsacks, like brown paper bags. And you know, your policy is the same. No phones, whatever. Now, if the kid gets their phone out, is on their phone, you give them a paper bag, they have to staple their phone in the paper bag until class is over and then they can rip it open and recycle it. Can you can you not just give them a detention for having the Oh my gosh, Jack. I wish teachers could get detentions these days. (laughs) It doesn't help. (laughs) Even if you do, they'll just get out the next day. (laughs) Jack, I've written kids up that don't get detentions, but we'll 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 just not talk about that. I got detention. Why can't you can't get detention? Teachers are literally not allowed to give out detentions at my school. So you mean like after school detentions? Yeah, it has, like, to okay. come, it has to come directly from administrators. Wow. That's the administrators crazy. aren't even in the classroom. Yeah, and the administrators don't give detentions either. Ugh, that is crazy. I like the paper bag approach though. That seems mm-hmm. and they And like one of the battles is like if you try to have your kids put it your their phone in what we call phone jail. Mm-hmm. A, it's you can't keep your eye on it the whole time. You don't know really whose phone's whose. Mm-hmm. And if something were to happen, you're liable for that. Yeah. And like they're always like, that's my property. That's my property. OK, fine. It's your property and it's in a paper bag. Jack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you should see his face. Yeah, Jack. It's it's Damn. like that. Um, But, you know, with the paper bag thing, you're not taking their property. You're just put sim- it in your backpack mm-hmm. in the paper bag. Yeah. And then obviously, like if they were to get into the paper bag or something, that's a something you can hear. So yeah. it's not as easy to sneak. Um, And then, you know, there's that option for the phone jail or the write up or something after that if they can't do the paper bag. But I'm going to try it and see how it works. I like yeah. it. I'm into it. But do you have a phone problem in your classroom? Um, My like as a learning like group of teachers like we were we're kind of able to solve it but we're also dealing with um less kids than you are and like we're more on the same page I think it really helps when like multiple teachers are on the same page yeah. or like your administration is on the it's same hard, page especially when yeah. like such a big school building where my kids have like yeah eight classes and you know five of them are strict on phones but yeah, three exactly. of them aren't and so it's like well miss blah 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 doesn't make me so how come and it's just like yeah it's a constant battle. The phones are crazy. Yeah. No, if we, I mean, we've had issues with phones definitely, but luckily like we were able to implement a policy that everyone who needed to agree on it agreed on it. So that like has been really helpful. What's the policy at your school? Just um, you turn your phone in right away when you get off the bus or when you arrive at school. Oh, yeah. okay. So yeah. you, the, they actually keep it all, like in like, the office all day. all day. Yeah. We keep it like locked up somewhere safe. Um, and like at the end of the day, they can have their phone back. If we like see them with their phone throughout the day, like we do still like collect it, even if it's like fifth hour, sixth hour, we'll still like take it. Just we had a like a lot of issues with phones and like you probably did too. And I think every teacher everywhere <laughs> probably has issues with phones, which it sucks because that would be a really good skill for them to learn for their future careers. Like every student, you know, like when you can get on your phone, mm-hmm. when you you know, shouldn't. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I just feel like these kids are just so addicted these days. Like mm-hmm. a lot of them got an iPad put into their hands when they were 
less than a year old Mm -hmm. for entertainment and like I know obviously that's a whole nother story and like we're not getting into that but like it's just hard when their attention spans have become so like a goldfish or like TikTok I know TikTok is (laughs) ruining the kids or like Um, yeah or it's just they like the constant entertainment which I don't blame them because I love TikTok (laughs) watching TikToks but they but don't you think that TikTok is ruining your attention span too because it's ruining mine. Uh, yeah, it definitely is. Oh my gosh, it definitely is. But also, it's just hard because some you also have like the fight a lot of times, especially like with my school being so big, like you're going to have pushback from some parents about the phone thing. Like mm-hmm. you can't just make a school wide, there's no phones because there's so many parents and you're going to get pushback on that. Like, not to be well, morbid. And you guys can't lock up like a thousand phones. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. 1800. Um, yeah, I knew a thousand was not even enough, (laughs) but like, it's also just like, this is kind of morbid, but like with all the school shootings and stuff, like parents want their kids to have their phones on Mm -hmm. them because they, in a scenario like that, obviously devastating, like they need, they want to be able to get, get a hold of their students. And so that's like one of the things too, I liked about the paper bag thing is like, in an emergency situation, mm-hmm. boom, paper bag's open, no problem. Yeah. Phone's still on. on in I, my possession. I'm in on the paper bag. I think that's a great idea. Well, Dina sent me the Facebook reel, so shout out to Dina. <laughs> oh, well, what a gem. And I told Jenna Robinson about it, and when she goes back to teaching my friends taking a uh-huh. gap year, she'll she'll be implementing that. She said, I got to write this down. Speaking of that. That is cool. Good luck. I hope that works. I yeah. hope it does, too. Your student is did recognize me before before Derek went to Katie's high school once because Katie was participating in a teacher student basketball game Oh, fun. and Derek <laughs> tried really hard to make the day about him and we kept telling him today is about Katie mm-hmm. and unfortunately for the rest of us Derek ended up getting recognized and then he still thought the day was about him <laughs> Miss Caldwell still asks me about you all the time I know. That was awesome. Is that pretty much what happened, Derek? His ego yeah. was bruised. <laughs> because it was, God forbid, we do something that's not about him. Oh. This is what we're working on with Derek. I'm I'm nervous about my wedding day. Because Derek doesn't think it's about me and Chris. He thinks oh. it's about him. Well, he did make <laughs> Jenna's graduation day about Derek. Oh. He did. Because Derek graduated from high school the same year that Jenna graduated from college. So obviously oh. they got to share every single day. Mm-hmm. Even Jenna's actual graduation day where he gave us a, a toast, toast about himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are you going to do on her wedding? Well, he's going to do what he's asked to do. Right, Derek? Well, I, I, I am going to make this super fun for sure because I... I do want to see a epic vlog. He wants to make an epic vlog for your wedding. Oh God, no! <laughs> yeah, see? that's what the videographers are for. <laughs> that we're literally paying two photographers and two videographers so that we can make all the content we want from it. You, you, we're gonna have to talk about this. You will be with Kyle all day. Mm. So my cousin Kyle, we already have talked about it. Like he is going to be the Derek Wrangler. The Derek, <laughs> the Derek Wrangler. Derek, <laughs> the Derek Snake Wrangler. That's so valid. And he's going to hang with Derek and he's going to make sure he doesn't Derek get bit. gets where he needs to go. He's mm-hmm. going to make sure Derek does have the time to make some content, do some things like that. But you know, Chris doesn't want to be in the content. You can't make a vlog with on a wedding day with n- oh, no groom. That's That'd true. be awkward. Well, my, it's okay, Derek. Man. My goal: make sure not put Chris on. Yeah, you can't put Chris in it. It can just on be camera. It can just be about us, the Baker fam. It's okay, Derek. We but, can do man of honor, maid of honor stuff. Who cares about the bride? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> but we're we're going to have um two people gonna to interview, bunch of guests, especially. You maybe up. Maybe Derek can go around and ask a bunch of people, "What's your message for the bride and groom?" That'd that would be, be kind of cute. That'd be a cute vlog. Exactly. That's the reason Zach and I would do it. It's bring the cow too. He oh, can bring okay. one of these microphones. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> What's we'll your message for the bride it. and groom? We'll have to talk about it, okay, Derek? Shoving microphones into strangers. Well, not strangers, but people's face. <laughs> N- nobody will expect it. Derek less on the from street. You. 
Derek on the dance floor. <laughs> We, wow. Honestly, we should do some Derek on the street. Let's go to downtown St. Louis and do some Derek on the street. Oh, boy. I would watch that. Oh, That'd my be God. Really good. That'd, That'd be, be good. really cool. Okay, we're going to go cool back to teaching sure. really quick. Is that okay? So I just want to throw that out there. Jack and I will, Dan, when you will, work on the best epic vlog of your big day. Okay. We're going around to interview a bunch of people, and especially, especially you. And we'll see all about Chris. He's... he's <laughs> A little bit of camera shy. Yes. And, and I did tell him about is he camera shy. I told him that. And he said, you texted and asked him. And what did he I say? I asked him that. And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So I did. So I know in the past we've talked about this. Like you do work with students who have disabilities, but you've also struggled with those stu- same students mistreating others who have disabilities. And like, I know you've struggled in the past with some of your students, like using the R word and mm-hmm. things like that. So how do you kind of navigate that kind of a situation? So I think it's it's tough, first off, because I don't always think the students... I think sometimes it's like because they have a lack of vocabulary for what they're actually trying to express. Um, Also, I think sometimes they don't understand others who have different disabilities that look different from what they're dealing with or going through. So with like respecting those other students, um, something that has helped is just explain like, I mean, do you want to be called that? Like, how would you feel like if somebody called you that? Um. Maybe talk with them about, you know, they can still understand you. They can hear you. Like, they know when you call them that. Just kind of, like, trying to place them in their shoes. And I always try to let them know, like, I would never want someone to call you that. I would never, like, accept that, you know. Um, But it is a difficult situation because, like, of ableism. Like, it doesn't just – ableism isn't just from, like, people who don't have disabilities. It can be from people who have disabilities, too. So – Yeah. I know Derek, actually, there was a time in high school where he was kind of getting a little bullied by somebody who was in his Mm -hmm. special education classroom with him. And I think part of that, like you said, was, like, the thing that that student struggled with was more social – Mm. Whereas Derek, we all know he does not struggle with the social side. Yeah, of they were things. just jealous because Derek was so awesome. So when Derek, not you know, about that, Katie. When Derek <laughs> had a bunch of friends mm-hmm. who were general population students, and when Derek would not sit with the special education kids, and he would sit with the mm-hmm. table full of senior girls, <laughs> and you know all that. Sam kind and of Allison. Thing. Yeah, <laughs> that would you know the other kids with disabilities would find that to be frustrating or annoying, or maybe they were jealous about it. And then they would actually take it out on him in the special education classroom. And that was something that I know like Miss Robinson and his teachers struggled to navigate and figure out how to make this work. Do you remember that Derek? Do I remember having lunch with your friends? Well, do you sure? Do you remember that? They were awesome. Do you remember getting mistreated by some of your classmates in the special education classroom? Well. He's got that one trauma blocked. Yeah, that might be true. That one was a little bit of, a little bit of tra- travel right there. but tra- is it? Do you remember it or do you, do you kind of block it out? I, I, I'm trying to block out the haters. Got it. Got it. But. That is their opinion, not mine. Right. That's so. What, what, whatever I do in, in the lunch room, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Do it my my way. Period. Love that. And that's where it is. And reason I get get mistreated or get getting bullied and something like that. I feel unappreciated that actually happened to me. So, my question for you, Catherine, mm-hmm. do you see anyone getting cyber bully in your school? So, maybe not necessarily cyber bullied 
Because, like, unless a student would maybe show me. Yeah, that's hard to see as a teacher. But I have seen students be mean to other students. And I don't know if you would necessarily call it bullying. But either way, it's not nice. And it's unkind. Whether it's just Mm -hmm. one comment or, you know, multiple comments. um, I do see it. And I do try my best to call it out when I see it. To let the student who's doing it know that's not okay. But then you also, it's hard because you want that other student, you don't want to like step in their way. Like if they want to stand up for themselves too, I mean, obviously at a certain point you have to intervene, but I have a question for you, Derek. Okay. So when somebody was mean to you in high school, would you say anything to them? Like that hurts my feelings or would you ever let them know how it made you feel? Well, to be honest with you, um, whatever um, they 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 do decide to to hurt me and and, and sh- trust me I I just want to annoy the haters annoy the bullies and sometimes they they, they do get under my skin and uh, uh, get on my nerves and would you and, ever say anything to them or stick up for yourself and I I told them told them to stop that's not very nice. If they they don't do they don't have to listen to that, I will go to talk to the teachers for that. Mm-hmm. Same question for you, Katie. Do you handle cyberbullying at your school? Well, you know, high schoolers can be quite rude um, and mean. I definitely have had situations where my students have said like oh, they said this about me or, oh, they said this about me and they were talking about, you know, things that were being said online. I think that especially in today's day and age of social media, it's really easy for those keyboard warriors to hide behind their screens. Derek, what I wanted to say was I think that, one, if your friend came to you and opened up about some bullying they were experiencing, that means that they really trusted you. And I think that it's really awesome that you created an environment that allowed them to feel confident that they could come to you for help. And two, I think it's really brave of you to be willing to get the teacher involved because I think a lot of students are scared to go to the teacher. And Derek was like, "Uh uh-uh, not on my watch. I'm telling the teacher. And he, and I love that. I love that you were not afraid to do that and not afraid to go to a teacher for help when you knew somebody was experiencing something that was not okay. I'll agree with that. Well, I was going to say, if my, my, my friend, don't use their name. Okay. <laughs> have me, have me a plum lum or um, somebody is bullying you online, like tags or some cr- crazy memes, like, Okay, said, but it's not okay to do cyberbullying. That's the reason Disney Channel says this all the time. Choose kindness. I choose kindness because I getting that teacher involved. No, no students is afraid to ask the, the teacher what's going on. I, I step up. I I ask the teacher what is going on. And I did that. I did that with my friend. I would do did it for everybody else because I am that person. I am kind. I am kind. And did I mention I'm kind to everybody? You, did I mention I'm kind? No, you didn't. I love that, Derek. <laughs> okay, we do have to start wrapping this up, but I have Either one. Anyway. <laughs> Daisy Daniel Channel says every time shoes kindness. I love the Disney Channel quote. <laughs> it's amazing. And don't be a cyber bully. Amazing. Period. So Catherine. So shout out to you, <laughs> Disney Channel. <laughs> so like from what we've talked about so far, mm-hmm. I can just tell that. It seems like you're a very, you know, patient person in the classroom. Mm-hmm. And I 
think that's probably something where I could work on. I think maybe it's a little bit easier to be patient when you have three kids that are bothering you versus like 25. But like what is some advice that you could you have towards young teachers or people who are looking to go into the profession or just people who are teaching but do struggle with their patients sometimes like mm-hmm. how do you maintain that level-headedness and you mm-hmm. know your calmness and that kind of thing okay so two things one it's really hard it's not always easy even if like you're a veteran teacher of like 25 years versus like your first year but um One thing that, like, I remember, like, when I was, like, taking classes in special ed is they were, like, okay, like, think of, like, one sentence that kind of makes you think why you're there. And it's so cheesy, but, like, your why, you know? You probably, like, every PD you've been to, it's probably, they say, think about your why. But one thing I think about is every student, like, deserves you at your best even when they're acting their worst, And, like, that kind of helps me a little bit. Um, But I'm human, too. So, like, even though I do think I'm pretty patient, there's times where I lose my patience. And I think that's only human. But kind of going off there, you also have to, like, take care of yourself, too. Mm -hmm. Like, like the self-care stuff that you do outside of school, like, that really helps me inside of school. So, like, whether it's, like, simply, like, sleep or taking, like, a luxurious bubble bath the night before, like – just making sure that like you take care of yourself because you can't take care of others if you aren't taking care of yourself. So just trying to remember those two things. That's good advice. Uh, amen to that. <laughs> okay, we do have to wrap it up. I have one more question and then if you want to end it with one more question, you can do that after me, yeah? Sounds good. Okay, so I do think, and this is something that Katie, we've talked about as you have navigated like your first year of teaching I think, unfortunately, we've gotten to a place where, and this is me very much generalizing, obviously, I don't work in a school, but I think the response to teachers from parents is not as supportive as I feel it was when we were students. Like, I think we've even talked about this, Jack, like when I was a student, if I messed up, it was my fault. And if the teacher said I did something wrong, my parents believed the teacher. I feel like, unfortunately, we've kind of gotten away from that a little bit. So I want to know from both of you, like, if you could give a message to, if you could give a message to the parents of especially high schoolers, like, what, as teachers, what what could, would, what would you want them to know that would maybe, you know, make your lives a little easier? Well, I think one thing that I don't think I did last year that I want to do this year is I don't think I sent like a mass blast out at the beginning of the year, like introducing myself and like saying what I expect in the classroom. So I think it would be a good idea to do that this year just so that the parents, the first time that they hear from me is in a, hey, your kid messed up. It's a, Mm -hmm. this is my, this is who I am. And so I, I plan to, you know, during that first week, reach out to all the families and, you know, introduce myself. And I really want to make it clear. I don't know what that message is going to be yet, but I want to make it clear within that message that I'm always going to have their students' best interests at heart and that I just want, you know, to work with the students and with their parents to, you know, help them put their best foot forward. Um, I think that it's hard because obviously, like, a crappy teacher is not going to ever say that they don't want the best for the students but like I think just being proactive with that and really like trying to convince them from the get-go that like I'm here for your kids I'm here for their learning and that kind of stuff will go hopefully a long way when it does come to the point where you know Derek Baker messed up in my classroom and he acted a fool of himself and I have to call home they know that Miss Baker is calling home out of like a place of warmth and a place of caring Mm -hmm. and not out of a place of like, oh, this kid or this teacher just doesn't like my kid and it's not their fault and that kind of stuff. So I think like being more proactive with the introduction to the parents um, hopefully might help that. But yeah, I think just being like upfront about like, I'm here for your student because really that is my why. My why is to have like even one person better off after having me as their teacher than they were before. And so that's, I just want to make that goal clear. 
I love that. <laughs> that was good. Thanks. Um, so I agree with what you just said too, but I think by, like you were saying, establishing communication with your parents or guardians, like before there's an incident is like extremely helpful. One thing that I always like to let the parent know is like, I'm here to keep you updated like about your student. And I always ask how do you have any suggestions or ideas of how we can support this in the classroom? Or like, do you also see this at home? And I think those questions kind of open up saying like, I'm not just like tattletaling on your student. You're, um, I'm like here to like fix this issue. So I think that kind of helps too. But definitely also like reporting home good news too. Like I have a parent that like I will update all the time, but I also try to update good news as well. So do you see your all your students' parents ahead of times with the IEP meetings and stuff? Like, do you get um, to know the parents a little bit more? So, no, because, like, IEPs are due different times throughout the year, so I don't necessarily see them all. Um, like, we have a meet the teacher, like I think mm-hmm. most schools yeah. do. And um, not every parent comes to that, but the parents that do, it is definitely beneficial and helpful because, like, you get to talk face-to-face, which is, like, better because, like – I don't know about you, but a lot of my parents prefer email and texting. Some prefer phone calls, which I think are a little bit more personable and you're able to like convey a a tone, you know, of sincerity better. But um, but yeah, so like I like email and I text my parents a lot, but I do love when they come to open house because I think that really helps kickstart a good working communication and relationship with them. Well, on that note, I have a question for you. How do you feel having a disability kid, kids when you're work, working with? How has that changed your life? How has that changed my life? That's a good question. I think that I see, like, the success in smaller things now. So, like... Instead of thinking like, oh, like I have to like do this huge, great thing to be successful. Like I can see success in smaller steps. And I also really appreciate humor. Um, That's one thing I like in my classroom. I try to try to be funny or try to joke around with my students. But I like to be funny, too. But sometimes I'm the only one laughing. Uh, Yeah, same. (laughs) But then that makes it even more funny. Like I laugh even harder. Yeah, and then my students are just laughing at me because Uh, I'm the only one laughing at my Uh, joke. But yeah, definitely, I think working with kids and um, people with disabilities makes you see, like, success in smaller things, which I think is how everybody should see it, too. It's good because it helps you see, like, the light part of Mm -hmm. life and, like, just the successes and Mm -hmm. the little wins. Yeah. Well, I just want to say the world needs more people like both of you, and I think that Teachers don't get as much appreciation as they deserve, but I know you both work really hard. I know you both have really beautiful hearts. I know that you love and care about the students that you deal with or not deal with. Uh, maybe that's a bad <laughs> word. <laughs> Sometimes you deal with Sometimes them. Sometimes you got to deal with them. Sometimes. Um, the, the students that you impact their lives and they impact yours. And I think mm-hmm. that you guys are both great examples for you know, the next generation of educators. And thank you guys for for being vulnerable and open and honest about the experiences that you have in the classroom. And I think you're doing great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Do you think we're doing great, Derek? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) I do. Okay, well, that is all we have time for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will be back on Thursday with Derek's Top Ten in Wrestling. Derek's going to interrupt right. me. What do you got there, buddy? I just I just want, want to throw this out there. Next week, we are headed to New York. This is true. By the time this episode comes out, we'll be on a plane to New York. And well, we'll be on a plane Canada. to New York. Me oh. and Catherine, Catherine will be teaching. Katie Catherine and school. Katie will be at school. <laughs> Canada. We are not going to Canada, my guy. Canada is part of it. Remember? Canada is not a part of it. Canada is not on our trip. Boston. Connecticut. Connecticut. Not Canada. <laughs> Very different. Very different. Very different right there. <laughs> Connecticut's a state. Canada is a country. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> anyway. We do not need our passports for this trip. No, we don't. Yep. For sure. <laughs> 
No doubt. Anyway, if you're from New York City. Or Boston. Or Boston or... Connecticut. Connecticut. And you think you see us. If you if you see us, please come find us. It's going to be super fun. If you see us, say hi. We are in the Northeast this week. All right. Yes. It's been a great podcast. Thanks for listening. All right. Find us on all the platforms at Baker Banter. Make sure to check out our cameo. I do have our my Etsy store on our link tree. Jenna Baker Jones Creations. Yeah, JBJ. Creative, right. yeah, I'll have to show you. Yeah. It's new. Um, we have merch on bakerbanner.com and like, Liza share, merch. subscribe, subscribe. We will talk to you guys all next time. Peace. 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 <laughs>